So it's my pleasure to, to introduce my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Liviu Klein, who earned a medical degree at the Carol Davila University of Medicine in Bucharest, Romania. He then uh, earned a master's of science degree in clinical investigation at Northwestern, where he also completed a residency in internal medicine uh, in that area at the Advocate Illinois Masonic Medical Center in Chicago, uh, then came back to Northwestern uh, for a fellowship in cardiovascular uh, uh, epidemiology. Uh, also at Northwestern's McGraw Medical Center, he completed fellowships in cardiovascular disease, advanced heart failure, um, heart transplantation, and clinical cardiac electrophysiology. So he's a uh, kind of a rare gem with um, uh, really this multidisciplinary training within cardiology and, uh, and multiple representing multiple subspecialties. So we're very fortunate now to have him uh, at UCSF, uh, where he is the director of the Advanced Heart Failure Comprehensive Care Center, as well as the director of the Mecha Mechanical Cir Circulatory Support Program. He specializes in treating patients with heart failure and arrhythmias, uh, including care before and after surgery for those receiving heart transplants. Together with uh, colleagues in the Department of Bioengineering and Therapeutic Sciences, he is also developing new technologies for monitoring and treating patients with heart failure and other kinds of heart disease, including those with ventricular assist devices. He's published more than 100 peer review articles and books. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over uh, to Dr. Klein. Thank you. Thank you so much, Greg, and um, it's great to be here. Um, I'm really um, excited to talk to you about uh, heart failure or um, you know, the, the path from failure to recovery. Um, uh, you know, thankfully, we have so many uh, effective treatments uh, nowadays, as Greg has mentioned, and I'd like to, uh, to share them with you. But first, you know, what is heart failure? Well, it is uh, very different than other things that we have in cardiology, such as high blood pressure or heart attacks, where um, those are just diseases. Heart failure is really a complex clinical syndrome that can result from many, many structural or functional uh, problems to the heart. But basically, th those problems can impair the heart or the left ventricle to either fill with blood, and we call that diastolic problem or diastolic heart failure, or eject the blood. So we call that systolic problem or systolic heart failure. As a result, the pressures in the heart on the left side of the heart increase and the normal pressure is about 12 millimeters of mercury. So those pressures increase over 15 millimeters of mercury and the patient starts to develop symptoms. And sometimes the ejection fraction, which is the amount of blood that uh, it's pushed out from the heart and the amount of blood that remains in the heart can be normal or low. So if it is normal, we call that heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or diastolic heart failure. If it is low, we call that heart failure with systolic ejection fraction, uh, with reduced ejection fraction or systolic heart failure. So heart failure can really be caused by a variety of reasons. Uh, most commonly in the Western world, it's coronary artery disease uh, and hypertension. Those are the two most common reasons why patients will develop heart failure if those go on for a long time. Atrial fibrillation uh, or valvular disease are other causes of heart failure. And eventually patients who have diabetes, if it gets you know, uncontrolled for a long time, can get to heart failure. There's a growing group of patients who may develop heart failure, patients who have the so-called cardiomyopathic factors, which are patients who undergo chemotherapy for cancers. Some of those chemotherapies can lead to heart failure over time. And that's why it's very important for us to monitor um, those patients and monitor their heart function. Eventually, all these factors over many, many years can uh, lead to uh, injury of the left ventricle to the left side of the heart, uh, sometimes to the right side of the heart. Some patients will have a decrease in the ejection fraction, so the amount of blood that comes out of the heart will be low. And all these patients will have a remodeling of the heart. So the normal heart will start to become dysfunctional and some patients, if untreated, some patients will uh, eventually die from heart failure. The most uh, known reason for heart failure in the past used to be heart attacks when patients were presented to the hospital, you know, possibly late after they had a heart attack. And then the initial infarct, as you can see here in this picture, uh, started to um, spread sort of the uh, dysfunction of the myocardium of the heart muscle started to spread. And eventually, uh, in a few hours, the infarct was expanding 
and it would lead to global remodeling, so dilatation of the heart increasing the ventricular size. Fortunately, we have a lot of new technologies now where uh, patients uh, get to the hospital very quickly and they are able to go to the cardiac catheterization lab and then get stents placed, uh, uh, you know, uh, during their heart attack, which will save a lot of the heart mass, a lot of the myocardium. So we don't see a lot of uh, patients with remodeling after infarct uh, anymore. The second reason why, why patients may have heart failure, as I mentioned, is high blood pressure. So uncontrolled heart high blood pressure over a long period of time leads to a thickening of the heart muscle. So the muscle becomes hypertroph uh, hypertrophic. You know, uh, since the blood pressure is really high, the heart has to um, accommodate uh, and the muscle has to um, increase in size in order to push against that high blood pressure. Similarly, when uh, patients have valvular disease, the extra uh, amount of blood in the heart because of um, leakage, for instance, leads to an increase in the heart muscle and that muscle becomes hypertrophy. Uh, and eventually over time, the, the, the heart muscle cannot cope with this increased um, afterload and starts to dilate. So the heart becomes dilated. Uh, essentially, you know, from a normal heart, we can get both to uh, two types of dilation, you know, volume overload when the heart becomes very, very dilated and pressure overload when the heart muscle becomes thick and eventually will dilate. So they both have a lot of common mechanism and a lot of genes get turned on uh, in, in the heart and a lot of uh, uh, muscle cells, uh, the proteins in the muscle cells uh, become um, abnormal and eventually to this uh, remodeling or, or pathologic um, shape. I uh, just want to show you, for example, a patient who received the heart transplant, you can appreciate the heart in the normal size, kind of fits in the surgeon's hand. And then this is the heart that sort of came out uh, of, of that patient. You can appreciate uh, the pictures are actually um, same uh, magnification. And you can see that the uh, diseased heart is probably two and a half, three folds larger than the normal heart. And then you can appreciate this uh, sort of gray area here where the patient had a new part. Um, so clearly, the heart becomes very, very abnormal. So how does, uh, you know, the uh, syndrome progress over time? So essentially, we start with somebody that is normal. They have no symptoms. They have normal exercise capacity. If we measure their heart function with an echocardiogram, for instance, uh, it looks normal. And then at some point, um, a clinical event happens. Again, maybe a heart attack, maybe years of uncontrolled hypertension. And at that point, the patient's heart starts to remodel, becomes abnormal. Initially, patients will have what they call asymptomatic left ventricular dysfunction, which means that if we would do an echocardiogram randomly without a patient having any symptoms, we will note that the heart is abnormal. However, when we query the patient, there's no exercise intolerance. Patients can function normally, can go to the gym, can you know, perform physical activities without any symptoms. So that's the stage of compensation or asymptomatic LV dysfunction. Again, without med medications, the progression of the disease continues and patients eventually will develop symptoms. And the two main symptoms of heart failure are really what they call shortness of breath or dyspnea and fatigue. So patients become very, very tired, which may limit the exercise tolerance. Due to these changes in the heart function, a lot of hormones are produced in the body. Heart, uh, the heart is really uh, related to the kidneys in uh, order to eliminate a lot of the fluid. So the kidneys now start to retain salt and fluid and patients start to develop pulmonary congestion or peripheral edema, so swelling and weight gain due to fluid accumulation. Now, both abnormalities can impair the functional capacity. And some patients may be just short of breath or have fluid retention. Some patients may be fatigued. Some may have all these three symptoms. So it's not necessary for all those to uh, appear at the same time in all the patients, at least in the uh, initial stages. It used to be that um, we, uh, we called the heart failure congestive heart failure because it was thought that all the patients would retain fluid and would become congested. We now know that that's not the case. So the, the term congestive heart failure has been replaced just by heart failure. As I mentioned initially, patients, when they start to become symptomatic, they are compensated. So they still have a fairly normal excess capacity. Uh, they could go um, you know, to do their activity of daily living but if you put them uh, on a stress test, for instance, on a treadmill and perform a stress test, they will have an abnormal excess capacity compared to peer of the same age. And again, if you look at the echocardiogram, the heart function will be abnormal. Eventually, without treatment, uh, the heart starts to get worse and the patient starts to decompensate. So they become symptomatic, 
even with uh, you know regular activities, going you know upstairs or walking a couple of blocks, they will start to have symptoms of shortness of breath or. Uh, the excess capacity will be even further decreased in these patients. And again, if we do another cardiopulmonary stress test or regular stress test, we'll see that uh, the limitations become more profound. And the heart function becomes even more abnormal. And again, some of these patients, even despite treatment, will become refractory or as we call it, advanced or end-stage uh, heart failure, where despite all the medications and the devices that we have, we cannot control their symptoms. And they will have to be, um, you know, evaluated if they qualify for a heart transplant, for instance. Now, you may have read or may have heard about classification of heart failure in terms like new heart functional class or stages, or maybe when you go to your physicians. Now you can read the notes and you can see some of those terms uh, in the notes. I'll, I'd like to explain what they mean. We have a staging system for heart failure, really to alert the primary care provider and the patient that there are conditions which if they are untreated can lead to heart failure. So I call those stage A. So this is really patients at risk for heart failure. They could have coronary artery disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, valvular disease, atrial fibrillation. And we know if those conditions are untreated, eventually the heart function will deteriorate and patients will develop heart failure. Then we have stage B, which is patients already have an abnormal heart function. So again, if you randomly get an echocardiogram, you will see that the heart function is abnormal, but the patients don't really have any symptoms. And then we have stage C, which are symptomatic patients, so patients who have a formal diagnosis of heart failure, and they start to have symptoms. So those patients in stage C, we try to classify how symptomatic they are based on their activities. So then we have the New York functional classification, which is class one to class four. Class one is someone that really has no limitation on ordinary activities. However, if you do a stress test, a formal stress test, they will be limited. But in the day-to-day -day life, they have no limitations. Class two are patients who have just slight limitations to physical activity. Maybe they can go up three flights of stairs, but then they, they will have to, uh, to rest. Or maybe they can carry groceries for a couple of blocks, but then they will have to rest. Class three, which is most of the patients that I see in my practice, are patients who are markedly limited. They can you know, maybe perform some basic um, activities of daily living, they can shower, they can cook, they can, you know, uh, clean the house, but then if they walk outside for a couple of blocks, they'll be markedly limited, or if they walk up a flight of stairs. And then we have the class four patients who are really, really limited, even by, you know, sitting in a chair or sitting on a couch, they will get short of breath, or they'll get short of breath at night. And a lot of those patients are what we call stage D, so advanced and stage heart failure. And those are, again, patients that we would evaluate for uh, heart transplantation, for instance. So just to kind of um, recap what we've talked about is really the heart muscle, it's either weakened or stiff, right? So there's a dysfunction of pushing out the blood or reduced ejection fraction or systolic dysfunction. So the muscle is weak or a dysfunction of how um, much the heart is able to relax. So the heart becomes stiff. So that's heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or diastolic heart failure. As a result of either one of those, the pressures in the heart uh, increase, then you have leakage in the valve, in the mitral valve, and eventually you have high pressures in your left atrium, the top uh, left chamber, which will back uh, up fluid in the lungs and you know patients will start to become uh, short of breath. Because the heart is not able to push enough blood to, towards the rest of the body, um, the uh, patients will uh, start to have muscle issues and their um, skeletal muscles will become uh, very weak, so they will experience fatigue. So they'll be tired, they'll be short of breath. Again, uh, due to the kidney activation, they'll start to retain fluid, so they'll have leg swelling, they'll have abdominal swelling. Um, when the fluid goes in their lungs, they'll have uh, a lot of cough as a result of fluid accumulation in the lungs. And then all these symptoms will uh, you know, eventually progress. So how do the physicians make a diagnosis? Usually uh, patients present with these symptoms to either primary care physician or a cardiologist. And we really want to establish um, the diagnosis using certain criteria. And those criteria actually have de been developed over um, 50 years ago um, uh, in the uh, Framingham Heart Study in Massachusetts, Framingham, Massachusetts. And um, uh, those are very uh, rigorous criteria that we look for when we uh, examine patients. We have major criteria, minor criteria, and really they relate to 
the shortness of breath. So do the patients get short breath at nighttime? Um, do they need more um, than a you know, pillow to sleep? Do they need two or three pillows? Do they uh, sleep upright? Do they use a recliner? Do we see what we call jugular venous distension? So the vein in the neck, when you go to the physician office, you see a lot of physicians looking at the neck veins. The veins in the neck, the jugular vein, is connected to the heart. So if we see a uh, abnormality there, we know that the pressures in the heart are elevated. Do we hear uh, you know, fluid in the lungs, so pulmonary rouse? Um, do we hear an abnormal heart sound, what we call the third heart sound? So normally, the heart should only have two sounds, first and second heart sound. Uh, related to when the valves open and close. And then if we do hear a third heart sound that tells us that the pressures in the heart are elevated, the pressures in the, in the left ventricle are elevated, which will be a sign of heart failure. And then we have some other criteria, minor criteria. If the patients are short of breath only on exertion, so they have dizzy on exertion. Uh, maybe they're tachycardic, so the pulse is very fast. Maybe they have an increased size of their liver. Maybe they have swelling in their legs. So those are you know, minor criteria. And usually, you know, if you have two major or one major or one minor in the right setting, that pretty much gives you a diagnosis of heart failure. Now, we also know that uh, with heart failure, a lot of things happen in the body, in the heart, and a lot of um, biomarkers are released in circulation. So, you know, the heart muscle gets injured, so we have myocyte injuries of proteins such as troponin get released, and we can measure them in the blood. There's you know, inflammation, renal dysfunction, your hormone activation, matrix remodeling, oxidative stress. So all those have biomarkers or blockers that we can measure. Some are more useful than others, you know. Um, you know, it's function, for instance, we can measure creatinine in the end. As I mentioned, we can measure troponin. Uh, but the one hormone that's really, really helpful for us to diagnose heart failure is uh, a hormone produced when the heart muscle gets stretched. So when you have pressures increasing in the heart, eventually the heart side, as I mentioned, starts to dilate, the left ventricle or the left atrium starts to dilate. And under stress with dilation, the heart muscle starts to produce um, hormones called natriuretic peptides, DNP or antipro -DNP. Those hormones are actually very helpful because they're telling the kidneys to try to eliminate more water and more fluid and trying to counteract the uh, negative hormones that the body is producing as a result of uh, heart failure. And they're also trying to lower the blood pressure to uh, allow the heart to eject easier, to make the ejection easier. So they're called vasodilators. So they're vasodilators uh, and also um, uh, help the kidneys to uh, eliminate the fluid. Um, but they are also uh, very helpful in diagnosing heart failure. So a normal person should have a very low level of DNP or antipro BNP, maybe a BNP of 30 and an antipro BNP below 100 would be normal for a middle aged uh, adult. So if those values are higher, you know, two, three, four, five hundred, in the context of somebody presenting with shortness of breath, for instance, they will help to make the diagnosis of heart failure. Now, how common is heart failure? Well, it turns out that it's a disease of, uh, of the elderly. So you can see this are data from what they call the National Health uh, Assessment and Efficient Survey, NHANES, uh, which is a epidemiologic survey done in the United States. And we can see that in the younger age group, the prevalence um, is very low, about one or two percent uh, in patients uh, less than age, uh, younger than age 60, you know, slightly higher than men and women. Over age 60 or over age 80, it's very, very common. Essentially, one in 10 people uh, over age 80 uh, or over age 60, even, uh, especially in men, you know, they have heart failure. Over age 80, actually, women become equally or slightly more likely to have heart failure compared to men as a result of probably long, longer standing hypertension. So, again, it's a disease of the elderly. And if we look at epidemiologic data, uh, currently the mean age of diagnosis is around 72, 74, 80 uh, years of age. Um, so, compared to maybe 20 years ago, when uh, we had a lot of patients in their 50s as results of heart attacks. Now that demographic has changed by about 20 years. What about the ejection fractions? I mentioned you can have an ejection fraction measured by an echocardiogram, which is the amount of blood that comes out of your heart. A normal ejection fraction is between you know, 55 and 70 percent, meaning that the heart pushes out about 55 to 70 percent of the blood that's inside with every single beat. It never completely empties out the sleep. So, uh, you know, in the past, in the uh, 80s, as I mentioned, uh, because of the heart attacks, a lot of patients had low ejection fraction. 
you can see the average injection fraction was in the 35, 40 percent range. And over time, as the heart attack treatment uh, got better, the prevalence increased in patients who have preserved injection fraction, which uh, is especially weak. So patients who have high blood pressure, diabetes, and fibrillation will develop symptoms of heart failure uh, because of a stiff heart, so their ejection fraction would be normal. And again, if you look at uh, the data people from 2020, you know, the mean ejection fraction of diagnosis is around 50%. But we do have about half and half, about half of the patients have a low ejection fraction, half have reserved ejection fraction uh, when we look at the uh, population data. What about uh, the lifetime risk? So if you're a 40 year old, how likely is for you to uh, develop heart failure uh, if you get to age 85? It turns out that it is quite likely. So if you uh, see here data from uh, training and heart study, which now has been replicated in uh, other populations, um, you can see that uh, men and women uh, at age 40 have um, one in five risk to uh, develop heart failure by age 85. So it is it is quite uh, uh, quite high. Uh, and if they um, don't have a myocardial infarction, the cause of their heart failure, their risk is slightly lower, about um, you know, one in 10 for men, about one in six or one in seven for women. So still pretty high. Um, again, it's a very you know, unknown uh, factor. I think, especially in women, if you uh, ask women what is their likelihood or the chance of developing breast cancer, everybody will know that number, um, you know, chance about one in eight. Uh, but people don't know that uh, there's more likely to develop heart failure, for instance. Uh, than, than, uh, than breast cancer. And again, it's an underappreciated, uh, you know, disease. So patients, you know, once they are diagnosed with heart failure, they do have symptoms. And a lot of these patients actually come to the hospital and get hospitalized. About 80% of the uh, new diagnosis for heart failure are made, you know, unfortunately in the hospital, or again, patients presenting to the emergency room with shortness of breath or fluid overload or weight gain because of the fluid, and they're diagnosed with heart failure and they keep coming back as recurrent admissions for heart failure due to the worsening condition. And you can see here, you know, we made some strides in the mid 2010 with a decreasing in number of uh, admissions, but recently uh, those numbers actually have gone up uh, mostly in the urban um, environment, uh, but also uh, some in the, in the rural setting. Um, and you can see the new uh, cases, you know, the adjusted annual new cases, it's actually uh, going up uh, in the in the last uh, in the last you know uh, decade or so, we used to go down uh, in the 2004 to 2000, 2013, and then started to go up in 2013 uh, until now. So you have a lot of patients hospitalized with heart failure. Uh, in fact, if we look at the national um, data, there's about six six and a half million Americans who have heart failure, um, and we have about uh, you know uh, six to seven hundred thousand new cases every year. Uh, about 150,000 uh, patients die because of heart failure every year. Um, and uh, over a million patients get hospitalized with heart failure every year. So it is a very, very um, uh, morbid disease with a lot of uh, implications for patients, symptoms, family, families, and also for society from a cost perspective. As you can imagine, the, um, uh, most of these patients uh, being in the 65 plus age group are uh, Medicare patients. So uh, it turns out that heart failure hospitalizations are actually number one Medicare cost uh, every year. And there's a lot of work now to try to decrease those hospitalizations. If you go to the hospital, you know, the average um, length of stay is about five and a half days. But if you have more severe heart failure, it turns out that you stay longer in the hospital. And then if you have to be put on a medication called inotrope, the cost of care and the hospitalization get even longer. So if you have to be on an island for more than a couple of days, you're likely going to spend two to three weeks in the hospital. And again, it's our cost of care from 10 years ago. So, you know, $38,000 in 2013, it's probably 50 plus uh, now. So very, very expensive for, for, the, uh, for the society. Now, you know, the good news is that we can treat heart failure. Once we diagnose it, we have a plethora of medications and devices to treat heart failure. And as I mentioned, uh, the main uh, organs involved in heart failure are the heart itself, then the kidneys, and then the blood vessels. So we have developed medications that counteract the effects of um, the bad hormones that the body is producing on all these organs. So we have medications such as beta blockers or anything that ends in all, carvedilol, metoprolol, misoprolol. We have medication called angiotensin receptor blocker, nebulizer inhibitor, 
Um, I think the uh, trade names and trust, or you may have heard uh, the commercials. Uh, so Sacubitro Valsartan is the generic name. Aldosterone antagonists, such as the prurinone or spironolactone, SGLT2 inhibitors, medications such as empaglitrosine, uh, dapaglitrosine, so the end in flows in, uh, some people call them flogenators. It turns out that those medications are actually also affecting the kidneys and allowing the kidneys to eliminate um, fluid and protecting the kidneys from advancing to chronic kidney disease. They also can affect the blood pressure and they're great in reducing blood pressure for patients who have high blood pressure. In order to control the uh, fluid uh, accumulation in the body, we try to give medications that act on the kidneys and diuretics are obviously the mainstay, so medications, water pills that uh, will make you eliminate, uh, eliminate water. So medications such as furosemide, dimethanide, porosemide, uh, may be familiar with, uh, they uh, eliminate the, the salt and water from the body. Aldastra antagonists, as I mentioned, spironolactone also acts on the kidneys. The flozines, DAPA and empaglitrosine act on the kidneys. And then on the blood vessel, again, we have the sacubitrobasartan or other medications that are pure basal biomarkers such as uh, either sorbide or hydrolysis. So we use a combination of these medications and we have four more, four main classes of therapy, the beta blockers, the uh, angiotensin receptor blocker, nebulizing inhibitors, aldosterone antagonists, and the SGLT2 inhibitors. Those four are the mainstay of therapy, uh, which have been shown in many, many clinical studies over tens of thousands of patients to improve the heart function, improve the ejection fraction for patients who have a low ejection fraction, make it easy to relax for patients who have a preserved ejection fraction, prevent hospitalizations, improve quality of life, and improve survival. So again, very, very good medications to, um, to uh, delay the progression of heart failure. Sometimes, unfortunately, the heart failure progresses and a lot of the patients may develop electrical abnormalities, such as left bundle branch block, and for those patients who have electrical devices such as cardiac desynchronization therapy or CRT, uh, and I'll show um, in a few slides, I'll, I'll show those devices. Some patients may have, um, you know, the mitral valve, which separates the ventricle from the atrium, may be leaky because the leaflets get pulled, the leaflets get pulled from the ventricle bilates. So those patients may benefit from a mitral occlusion. So again, we have a lot of technologies um, to supplement the medications. Now, as I mentioned, one of the advances that we've had actually is in the diuretics. So diuretics are really the mainstay of therapy. And for many, many years, we used to take um, diuretics in form of oral pills or tablets. You know, now we have a, a medication that was just approved by the FDA last month as an injectable. So when patients come to the hospital, we have to give the uh, diuretics to the intravenous. Now this cartridge, it's really are going to be given just as insulin in the subcutaneous form. So patients can be at home with this type of cartridge for 24, 48 hours and get a continuous release of uh, furosemide instead of coming to the hospital. Uh, we, we used to have patients who were taking um, the tablet form of furosemide for instance for many, many years. And at some point, uh, uh, the kidneys became what we call resistant. So they developed uh, so-called uh, you know, uh, diuretic resistance. Um, and then the diuretics didn't work. So we had to get the patients in the hospital, give them intravenous diuretics in order to eliminate the fluid. Now we uh, have this option at home. So instead of coming to the hospital, we can do this at home. Very, very exciting news to again keep patients uh, at home. As I, as I mentioned, you know, when the heart starts to dilate, you know, we start to have electrical problems. And that's interesting because the heart is basically a pump, right? It's a mechanical pump that is powered by, by an electrical engine. And if you attended some of the uh, previous uh, med school classes, uh, mini med classes, you probably talked about the electrical system. But basically, we have a natural pacemaker that uh, starts in the right atrium and sends electrical impulses through the uh, heart muscle towards the left atrium and then towards the ventricles. And at some point, you know, some of these electrical fibers that are embedded in the heart muscle become deficient, become short circuit. Usually if the heart muscle, let's say hypertrophies, it starts to, the ventricle starts to dilate, those electrical fibers get stretched out and then they could short circuit. So patients can develop uh, an electrical conduction abnormality such as left bundle branch block, meaning that the impulses from the normal pacemaker 
take a very, very, very long time to get to the heart muscle. And as a result, the activation, the electrical activation and the mechanical contraction of the left side of the heart occurs many, many milliseconds later compared to the rest of the heart, to the right side of the heart, for instance, on the septum. And that inefficiency leads to a, a worsening in the heart dysfunction, worsening ejection fraction, worsening ventricular dilatation. Fortunately, we have uh, tools to correct that. So this is an MRI image, and unfortunately, I don't think it's going to play. But what it does, it's uh, something called tagged MRI. So we looked at the strain, which is the how much the heart muscle uh, fibers actually shorten. So in normally in systole during contraction, the heart muscle fibers sh should shorten. And in a normal heart, such as you see on the left side, a healthy heart, they should shorten and relax at the same time. So you can see here uh, the color uh, scheme here. Again, uh, fortunately, it doesn't play. But you can see that uh, the whole left ventricle here, as seen by the MRI, has the same color. We knew that the lateral wall and the septum, the anterior wall, the posterior wall, they all shorten and relax at the same time. In a cardiomyopathic heart, so a heart that has the funded branch block, you can see these colors become very different in different parts of the heart because the electrical activation is delayed. So you can see that, for instance, the septum contracts, but the uh, lateral wall is not yet activated, so it doesn't contract. We have this dysynchrony in the heart, and that leads, you know, if we have an echocardiographic picture here, it leads to ventricular dilatation. So we have an echocardiogram here where you see in yellow trace the left ventricle in a healthy heart, and you can appreciate the size is fairly normal. And if you look at the uh, walls of the heart, are fairly normal in size. And then we look at a heart that has the left part of the branch block. You can see the abnormal EKG. If you look at the EKG here compared to the normal EKG on this other side, you can see this, uh, you know, uh, broadening this uh, QRS complex that becomes very, uh, very large. And you can see that uh, the heart here is bigger in size. Um, and again, after uh, CRT, after we correct this electric abnormality, you can see the QRX complex on the right side uh, essentially goes back to normal, being narrow compared to before the uh, CRT. And the heart becomes smaller again, again, compared to the heart prior to, um, to the electrical uh, impulse. Now, as I mentioned, when the heart starts to dilate and the pressure starts to increase, the mitral valve, which is the valve that separates the left ventricle from the left atrium, starts to dilate. So the annulus of the mitral valve starts to dilate and the mitral valve leaflets, instead of closing, they become, uh, they stay open. And when they stay open, all the blood or significant part of the blood from the left ventricle goes to the top of the heart, to the left atrium. And all this regurgitation, the mitral regurgitation is actually the left atrium. Because just imagine that you have a balloon that you start blowing air, the balloon gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Similarly, the left atrium, if you have all this uh, blowback of mitral regurgitation, over time, the left side of the heart, the left atrium starts to dilate. Now, when it dilates, remember, we have electrical fibers inside the heart muscle fibers. When the muscle fibers start to dilate, the electrical fibers start to become short circuit and they produce something called atrial fibrillation. And you know, oftentimes patients with heart failure will present with atrial fibrillation because of left atrial dilatation caused by the mitral regurgitation, caused by the ventricular dilatation. So medications are very effective in um, remodeling the heart back to normal, but sometimes they're not enough. In those cases, we have mitral clips. So we have clips that go uh, inside the heart and on the left side, go from the right side of the heart to the left side, and they clip the mitral valve and, um, and make the leakage less. So this is an image of one of our patients who I uh, can see here, this is a transesophageal echocardiogram. So an echocardiogram is done from the stomach. So the patient swallows the probe, and then we look from inside the stomach to the heart. The stomach and the heart have the um, distinct advantage to be very, very close. So we don't have the chest to uh, distort the image. And uh, we see the left ventricle here. You can see it's a dilated left ventricle. And then the left atrium, and you can see the mitral valve. So all this color here, all this red color means that the blood is flowing back into the left atrium where it shouldn't be. And then you can see the mitral clip here. You can see this uh, very dense, uh, echo dense, uh, uh, opaque probe here. It's the clip. Um, and you know, after the clip, you can see there's very little if any leakage into uh, into the left atrium. So again, the mitral clip can reduce the mitral regurgitation which contributes to improve symptoms in patients and decreases the chance of atrial fibrillation or other, uh, other arrhythmias.
Now, what's interesting, as I mentioned, the pressures in the heart uh, elevate when one has uh, heart failure. So that really kind of gave us the idea, can we detect those pressures and can we ma manage those patients similar to what a endocrinologist would um, advise their patients with diabetes because high blood sugar is a trigger for diabetes. And we know that if you can measure the blood sugar, then you can treat with medications. So similar to that, we thought maybe we can build a sensor that can actually measure the pressure. So we, um, we have built such a sensor, uh, which is a very small um, size, you know, it, uh, it's the size of a quarter. And it's a very simple concept. Essentially, it's a capacitor that gets implanted in one of the arteries around the heart, in the pulmonary artery. And with the flow uh, around, uh, around it, uh, you can have these uh, deflections that are translated into waveforms. And we can see pressure waveforms uh, in patients. And in fact, patients at home, they have a pillow that they lie on, and then they have a button that they press, and this is the home unit. Once they press the button, the uh, uh, sensor that's inside their uh, pulmonary artery transmits the data and to a website and the clinicians can see the data and they can make um, recommendations in terms of medications or um, diuretics you know, for the patients to use. And again, it's one of our patients and you can see pressure severe systolic mean diastolic over time for many, many months. And again, our nurses, nurse practitioners and physicians look at those pressures and then they'll call the patient to tell them what to do with medications. And it's all based on, uh, you know, this tiny sensor that's, you know, uh, less than an inch in size inside their hearts. What's really interesting is uh, a lot of these pressure elevations are triggered by, you know, what people uh, do, what they eat. Um, and I just want to point out two uh, pressure elevations in this particular patient. You can see if you, uh, if you look before, the pressures are kind of coming down and they're fairly stable. But then there's two days here, two period, time periods uh, where the patient uh, had a high pressure. And if you look at the dates, they're actually very telling. So this is actually Easter and this is Christmas. So clear, clearly dietary indiscretions that led to this particular patient uh, having high pressures um, due to uh, probably an increase of you know, uh, intake of salt. Um, and our nurses saw that uh, over the weekend and the uh, next, uh, the following uh, Monday, of calling the patient to tell them to take more diuretics because they had increased pressures. Well, the other thing, as I mentioned, just like diabetes, if you can monitor the pressures, can you treat high pressures? So one idea that physicians had was maybe if we can get the pressures in the left side of the heart where the pressures elevate to offload somehow to the right side of the heart, patients will become less short of breath. So we build something called in uh, something called interatrial shunt. So essentially, it's a tiny sensor. It's a, it's a tiny hourglass shaped uh, device that gets implanted into, uh, into the heart. You can see it's very, very small um, and gets implanted through this catheter delivery system. Um, and it's uh, implanted under uh, a transesophageal echocardiogram or intracardiac echocardiogram. You can see the uh, left side of the heart, the right side of the heart, and then how this. Uh, catheter goes through the septum, makes a tiny hole in the septum. Again, this is the left side of left atrium, this is the right atrium here, makes a tiny hole, then we leave a wire in, and then we load this delivery system over the wire to uh, place the uh, interatrial shunt. And then the shunt is loaded onto um, uh, this delivery system. Um, the shunt gets uh, placed across the, the septum, and then the delivery system is retracted and the shunt is pulled back under uh, echocardi echocardiography and fluoroscopy. The shunt is pulled back. And there's one opening to the left side of the atrium and then one opening to the right side. You can see the shunt there um, and we can see the blood then uh, essentially flowing from the right to the left, offloading um, the left side of the, the heart and allowing patients to uh, have less pressures on the left side of the heart and um, hopefully uh, having less shortness of breath. Uh, we are uh, one of the sites actually uh, in this particular clinical study that just finished enrollment. Uh, and then hopefully next year we'll find out if this truly works when it's compared to, uh, to a control uh, patient, so patients who did not get the shunt. And you can see very nicely how the shunt flows and uh, we have a uh, flow of blood uh, across uh, the septum of these patients. And uh, even, even a year later, 
Again, the shunt stays open and you can see really nice flow of blood from the left side of the heart to the right side. Uh, we had a few patients in the initial phase where uh, all the patients that had the shunt, we knew that they got the shunt and they had dramatic improvement. And now, as I mentioned, we just finished a randomized study where you know, about 510 patients across the US uh, and Europe were enrolled. We were one of the centers. Uh, and then half of the patients got the shunt and half of the patients did not get the shunt uh, in, in, uh, in a blinded fashion. We uh, needed a physician uh, treating the patient or the patient knew uh, if they did get the shunt or not. And again, we'll have to wait a year to see if uh, the results are, are positive or not. The other thing that can happen, as I mentioned, patients have heart attacks. And then when you have a heart attack, you have an expansion of the zone, uh, especially if you have the F anterior descending, you have an anterior heart attack. You have a, a ventricle that can expand and dilate, and you have a scar part of the heart. And that scar part of the heart is actually deleterious because it impairs the uh, heart's ability to squeeze and to contract normally. So for a long time, physicians have thought, can we remove that part of the heart? And there's a very famous French um, surgeon called Vincent Dor, who uh, invented this procedure, the Dor procedure. He practices in Monaco. Uh, and uh, you know, through the surgical procedure, he was able to cut out this part of the heart uh, and reconstruct the heart. Great idea, but obviously, you know, it's an open heart surgery, so now a lot of people wanted to do that. So the physicians came with the idea, can we do this in a minimal invasive fashion, where maybe we can have a catheter that goes from outside of the chest through a mini minimal in uh, incision and from inside the heart, and maybe we can pull these things together and get rid, of it, get rid of this scar. So indeed, it's a very interesting procedure. So you have the cardiac surgeons approaching the heart through the outside, through the ribs, and makes this tiny, tiny incision, and then the intervention cardiologist going from the uh, jugular vein uh, downstream into the right ventricle, and uh, putting this uh, wire through and then pushing really this uh, uh, mass of uh, scar tissue of infarcted tissue together and closing the heart and only leaving a normal functional heart. Uh, you know, we, uh, we have seen uh, in, in the study uh, a really nice result with patients' ejection fraction increasing and their symptoms improving dramatically. Um, and again, uh, this is what the uh, heart would look like after, after the procedure. And uh, even in clinical trials, and we'll see if FDA, as we review the data, we'll see if the FDA will approve this therapy as a um, definitive treatment for heart attack patients who have uh, uh, this type of uh, problem. Other patients, as I mentioned, can have heart dysfunction and dilatation without having the heart attack, but they do have really big heart. So again, the idea was, can we do something to constrain the heart to make it smaller? So indeed, we can have something called a um, cinch device or acu-cinch, where physicians go from uh, inside the blood vessels through the aorta, they go back into the heart and place this cinching device on the top of the heart below the mitral valve, and then they start pulling and making the heart smaller. And again, it's a very neat um, a device that goes through the aortic valve, again, below the mitral valve and gets cinched in place. Um, and then over time, the Harley models and become smaller. Um, as I mentioned, we're uh, one of the sites uh, for, for this study. Uh, we're actually deploying, we, we deployed the first uh, device in, uh, on the West Coast for this particular trial. And uh, we're still in the process of evaluating at the national level. So we'll, we'll probably know in the next 40 years if this particular therapy is helpful for patients with ventricular dilatation. However, some patients, despite our best intentions and best medications and devices and surgeries, will at some point start to or stop to respond to therapies. So they will uh, become what we call refractory or advanced or end stage. They'll have persistent class four symptoms. If you remember from the beginning of, uh, of the lecture, class four symptoms are uh, symptoms with minimal exertion or at rest. Um, some of these patients can barely shower or they can even make the bed. And they have a really high mortality, over 50% within a year, mostly driven by heart failure. Uh, so that's about 100,000 patients a year. And again, there's no more conventional therapy to, to perform. So a lot of these patients uh, should be evaluated for heart transplantation or heart pumps. Heart transplant transplantation 
Um, it's uh, great, you know, you replace the heart with a new heart. Unfortunately, uh, we have a limited donor pool and therefore we only do about 3,300 transplants a year uh, in the United States. Uh, it's the, uh, the green bar here, which I obscure by, uh, by mistake, but um, you know, the number hasn't dramatically increased over the last 20 years. Uh, because we have a limited uh, donor pool, um, and you know, if we did about 3,300 transplants last year, we have probably two or three, uh, four more people on the transplant list uh, waiting for a transplant. So we had to come up with new ideas on how to expand the donor pool and how to ensure that the organs that we have um, donated can, uh, you know, uh, function for a longer time. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with a heart transplant or if you've seen movies about heart transplant, uh, the classic where, uh, you know, somebody gets the heart that puts it on ice and then they drive or they fly to uh, the hospital where the uh, recipient waits and then a surgeon places the heart into uh, the patient's chest. So all this um, transportation used to be done with a cooler, uh, essentially with ice and the special solution. So the heart would just be on ice. Obviously, um, you know, we realize that it's not great and, you know, you can't really keep a heart on ice more than about four hours, maybe five, uh, if you want to function, it, uh, you know, normally when you place it again into the patient's uh, chest. Um, obviously, that would also limit you to, uh, to younger donors, right, 20, 30-year-old donors compared to 40, 50-year-old donors, because an older heart, even if it's normal, will come back, you know, a more, in a more difficult fashion. Uh, if it is kept on ice. So with this, we actually um, uh, came up with a, a special container called Sherpa Pack uh, made by this company where the heart is um, uh, placed and it's actually in a very controlled temperature setting. Um, so uh, we can monitor and you know the temperature can be um, changed at the parameters can be changed to keep the temperature constant. So that allows us now to extend this actually duration to four, five, six hours, uh, much, much safer, which allows us to go um, go out to maybe 1,500 miles, um, you know, for, for patients to take donors, it allows us to increase the age of donation to 40, 50, uh, because the hearts are better preserved. So we have a better preservation for, for those patients using the Sherpa pack. But the real game changer, I think, um, uh, it's going to be something called the transmedic OCS or the heart in the box, where we can actually take hearts from patients who are, you know, traditional donors. Traditional donors uh, or patients who um, have uh, so-called donors of circulatory deaths. And we can place these uh, donor hearts into a special system that keeps the heart beating, uh, as you can see here, keeps the heart beating in, in a box. And then we can uh, essentially transport this and keep it in this box uh, up to 24 hours. Um, and this is really uh, sci-fi uh, uh, when you look at it, but it is really, really real. And uh, uh, we're one of the few centers in the US that is using it, this technology. And uh, in October, for instance, uh, in September, we, uh, we did a number of patients with hearts coming out of Alaska or Tampa or Texas or, uh, you know, Minneapolis. And things that would have not been possible before without this technology. I think one of the patients that received a transplant, their heart was out of the donor body for about 12 hours, which again, it's something that is, you know, just bordering science fiction. Uh, and these patients are doing really, really well. And again, allows us to offer more um, chances to, to, more pay, to more patients. Now, the other thing that has happened, you know, uh, we still don't really have uh, a lot of hearts, um, even with this type of donation, a lot of hearts for older patients, or patients may be old, too old for transplant, maybe 75, eight years of age, and they're too old for transplant. So in those patients, we have heart pumps. And this is a uh, uh, picture history of, uh, of heart pumps. So these are the first heart pumps that we used uh, back in the day, you know, in the uh, late 90s. Uh, this is mid 2000s and this is, you know, 2010, this is 2020. So the pumps are becoming smaller and smaller and easier to use. And I just put a couple of x-rays for some of my patients. So this is a patient uh, back in 2007 when I was in Chicago. A patient from Michigan. He uh, was 6'4 and uh, 350 pounds, a really, really big person. And you can see the pump, it's extremely big, even if it's 
in this uh, in this man. Uh, so clearly, someone that was smaller in size would not been able to uh, to receive this pump. Uh, you know, fast forward a couple of years later, um, another patient um, that I had uh, back in Chicago, which was a 21 year old woman uh, who had postpartum perimyopathy, so she developed heart failure after giving birth to her uh, second child, and uh, we we had by now by then we had this uh, Harman two, so it's called the Harman one. We had the Harman two, the second generation pump, clearly much much smaller. Uh, and then, you know, very comparable in size to the fibrillator that she had. Uh, and again, uh, she was about 5, 120 pounds, right? So about a third in size compared to the gentleman on the left. Um, and she was able to uh, receive this pump and reach her successfully to a heart transplant. And then the third generation pumps, which are even smaller, uh, you can see the Harman 3, which is the current pump we use, that's now uh, being able to be implanted, you know, uh, completely inside the chest. So these other pumps, you can see that implanted in the abdomen, in the abdomen, and they cross over the diaphragm into the heart. Uh, these newer pumps uh, that implant inside the chest, uh, which obviously makes it uh, much much easier and allows the surgeon to uh, perform minimum daily surgery. So there's no more sternotomy. You don't have to uh, split open the, uh, the sternum, and the surgeons can make small incisions on the ribs, uh, you know, upper right and lower left. And you can see this patient actually you can, you can see there the fibrillator uh, and the heart pump somewhere in here. And you can see the size of the incision for the surgery are probably smaller than the fibrillator that he had. And then again, you see the drive line of the patient's uh, heart pump coming out and connecting to the batteries and the controller. So, really, really, again, exciting technology that, that we can offer patients and they can live, uh, you know, very full life. So, this patient, um, you know, got to travel the world, went to Egypt, went, you know, fishing, went uh, you know, to Alaska. And so, she enjoyed a really, really good quality of life um, uh, with, this, you know, one of these heart pumps. And you can see she's actually uh, made the purse where she uh, put her batteries and controllers. We don't even know that she has one of these heart pumps. So, again, people have, you know, normal quality of life. Um, so I want to end here and uh, allow some time for questions, but things to remember that heart failure is a complex syndrome uh, in, um, uh, in older patients usually with a very high morbidity and mortality. But we do have a plethora of medications and devices and surgical options available to improve the heart function and improve the quality of life and extend, um, you know, extend life. Obviously, for end-stage patients who have heart transplantation, and as I mentioned, we have new technologies to allow patients to receive hearts faster. Um, and for those patients who don't qualify, we have heart pumps, LVACs, who you know, uh, which uh, will increase the patient's again uh, lifespan and will improve their symptoms. And we are fortunate to to really be at the forefront of pioneering care for heart failure uh, in our institution in our center. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Dr. Klein, for packing in a lot of fascinating, important information into a, about an hour-long talk. So we have several questions, and please feel free to um, add others. Um, so uh, there was a, a, a question about differences in heart failure risk by uh, environmental settings, such as the urban versus rural setting, and some questions about um, the magnitude of that, if it's present, and what the potential explanations might be. Yeah, great question. So um, I, we, we know now that environment can affect the risk factors, right? So urban environment, especially in, uh, you know, neighborhoods that are um, uh, exposed to uh, inequality in, uh, in care and income, patients can develop high blood pressure, patients can um, eat uh, unhealthy food, they have no way to exercise, and all those risk factors can lead to uh, uncontrolled hypertension, um, coronary artery disease, which are risk factors for, uh, for heart failure. In fact, you know, the largest uh, increase in heart rates in uh, young African-American men, um, you know, if you compare to other uh, races. Um, so there's a lot of inequity um, uh, in, in those risk factor distribution and the risk for heart failure. Is it fair to say, though, that um, that's been a, empirically observed, but the the underlying mechanisms are, have yet to be truly elucidated? Correct. I mean, I think these are, uh, as you said, Greg, are empirical observations, and uh, we, we think that they relate to social 
factors, economic factors, you know, um, uh, environmental factors translate into, uh, uh, again, the biology, which leads to uh, an abnormal heart function. Um, there's also a comment that uh, it seems that there are so many of these, these new technologies are fairly uh, minimally invasive. And um, so there's a question about what whatever happened to open heart surgery, is there still a role for cutting open the chest and doing something that way? Absolutely, I think there's still a role for open heart surgery. And again, a lot of these procedures are surgical procedures. Uh, it's just that our talented surgeons can do them in a minimal fashion. So uh, as I mentioned, the LVATs, for instance, uh, we are one of the few institutions where our surgeons do what we call uh, bilateral thoracotomy. So incisions about a couple of inches you know, long on the left and right side of the heart. If you go to other institutions uh, around the city or, uh, or in Northern California, for instance, they still do the old traditional open heart surgery. Um, so I think it's just the techniques and the uh, devices that allow the surgeons to be very creative. Uh, you still have open heart surgery if you need a bypass, for instance, um, you know, uh, you know, valve replacement, still open heart surgery with minimal invasive techniques. A lot of the other procedures have become interventional type procedures, so minimal approach, as I, as I showed the shunts, the uh, uh, coursing devices and so forth. So um, I don't think we'll ever completely get rid of cardiac surgery. I think there's still going to be an important role, but a lot of these procedures are becoming more minimal. And in fact, the cardiac surgeons and interventions collaborate and work together during the procedure. Uh, another question um, is the role of physical fitness, lifestyle factors, and the relevance of that, especially as people develop more end stage uh, forms of heart failure. Yeah, it's a great question. So I, I think uh, we have pretty good data that physical fitness and exercise helps uh, both the heart failure with reduced and preserved ejection fraction. Uh, and uh, we have even clinical trials uh, proving that that you can improve symptoms uh, and then reduce hospitalizations, especially in women uh, compared to men. So very, very important. Obviously, you have to tailor um, the amount of physical exercise that one can do. Uh, and therefore, uh, cardiac rehabilitation, cardiac rehab, it's a phenomenal resource. Uh, and we encourage all our patients to attend cardiac rehab if possible. Uh, another question is, well, so many effective therapies, um, should we no longer fear heart failure? I, I would say yes, that's a great, that's a great uh, point. And uh, we really have a lot of therapies that we're starting now to talk about heart recovery. So we have a lot of these therapies where if we can intervene early, we can recover the heart muscle, uh, you know, bring it close to normal. Um, so in the 10 years ago, maybe heart failure was a death sentence. I would say that that's not the case in 2022. So I wanted to thank again, Dr. Klein, for an outstanding uh, presentation uh, and the audience once again for attending. And we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good night.